right, so our second, our second talk in this session is by Ram Koiches, um, and he's from uh, King's University, which is in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And his talk is gonna be a similar, talk, similar title to what Francis had, um, but not intentionally, perhaps. Uh, Flourishing through the activity of mathematics. So Ram, welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. Test, test, am I on? Good. Uh, thank you to the organizers. It's a great pleasure to be here. You have this pink ribbon. I am a first time attendee. I didn't really know what to expect. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to a slightly oddball mathematician, perhaps have some slightly oddball ideas. Um, I want you to imagine this. Imagine you see this announcement for this lovely conference. It's in California. I never get to go to California. It's about human flourishing. That sounds great. I've got ideas about that. I've got ideas about how mathematics fits into that. I want to talk about mathematics and how it inculcates virtues. And, and oh, I've read a lot of Simone Weil recently. I should talk about that. And I've got this idea, so I submitted an abstract. And, so, and you come down here, and then you come in the morning, and there's this esteemed mathematician who has way more awards and grants and things than you do who talks about inculcating virtues, and whose first quote is a quote from Simone Weil. And it, I was a little nervous. I was like, what do, what do I do now? Francis's talk? Just repeat it? So I'm going to ad lib a bit, because I, I've not met Francis before an hour and a half ago, which was lovely. Uh, I, I had no idea what that plenary was going to be about, but we ended up in sort of the same place. But the great thing about this is I had a bunch of slides of motivation, and my slides are way worse than Francis's slides of motivation. <laughs> so I'm going to assume you're all at the plenary this morning. And I'm going to skip ahead, and it's like, yeah, yeah, we can talk about mathematics as, as a human activity, and it creates virtues, and it, it's trying to put things into us other than just the utilitarian argument of why we do mathematics. That's already established. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just quickly step through a whole bunch of slides where I was going to talk about why we should do this and what I was trying to accomplish, and some quotes, whatever. <sighs> And we will get to the specific things I want to talk about. So, talk this morning did a really good job talking about the way in which mathematics can produce virtues. I want to talk about sort of a very specific subset of that. So the activity of mathematics, doing mathematics, as opposed to the outcome of the things you get out of it, is a part of human identity. That was where I started when I saw the theme of this conference. A human being is a thing that can, among many other things, do mathematics, and that's fantastic. And I want to argue that that piece of being human is valuable. And why is it valuable? We can go through all the things that were talked about this morning. It, it's a creative thing, it's artistic, it teaches abstraction, it teaches logic, it teaches humility, it teaches problem solving, and of course, all the utility of it teaching. We've got to do a bunch of calculations that we need to build bridges and feed people, and all that's great. So I want to talk about something slightly different. I want to talk about the idea of mathematics as a spiritual discipline. What can the activity of doing mathematics, sitting down, scribbling, drawing on chalkboards, what that, can that do for our spirit? And I'm going to do that with two examples. Two books that I've read recently, which I both highly recommend. No, this is blank screen. I want you to just look at me. I'm on stage. This is a great stage. I get this lovely auditorium. No, we'll get slides later. All right, before I start that, I want to make a little bit of a caution. So if I want to talk about mathematics as a spiritual discipline, I want to be a bit careful. I'm not going to say that mathematics is the key to unlock all of theology or Christianity. I'm not going to talk about mathematics being uniquely important. There is a tendency in mathematics, I believe, towards idolatry. And there, I think there's a good reason for that. Mathematicians look at things which Maybe they're actually cultural, but they seem to be sort of universal. There's sort of no argument about the basics of arithmetic. They seem to be something that transcends humanity. 
And you can think of that as, as a lovely, you can go for Augustine, ideas in the mind of God. There's a nice theistic interpretation of that, but you can also easily make that a kind of God. And many people have done this. David Hilbert's famous speeches about mathematics is a presuppositionless science. I don't need God to do it. It becomes a kind of idol. So I want to be modest today. I want to say that there are some things that doing mathematics can do for us spiritually without sort of going over that edge of making mathematics and its eternal seemingness into some kind of idol. All right. I have two touchstones, two books I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about one sort of very briefly in a teaser because I only have 20 minutes, and I'm going to talk about the second a little bit more. The first is a book by Lauren Graham and Jean-Michel Cantor called Naming Infinity, and it involves the intersection of two very fascinating things. The first is a religious movement. This is a religious movement called name worshiping, and this was active in the late 19th and early 20th century in the Russian Orthodox Church. And this was a kind of mystical practice where people would recite the Jesus prayer, which has a lot of importance in Orthodox Christianity, or a portion of it in a kind of meditative trance-like way with a theology related to the importance of the name of God. And in the more extreme versions of it, the name of God really became the thing that almost called God into being. And even saying that, you can realize why a lot of people in the Orthodox Church were sort of, they thought this might have been, you know, just a little bit heretical. But it was a movement. It was in the monasteries and it was in the churches in the Russian Orthodox Church. People would go to churches and, and participate in this name worshiping movement. At the time, there were two mathematicians, Dmitry Egorov and Nikolai Luzin. These are two mathematicians in Moscow, founders of the, to become very important in Soviet mathematics, Moscow School, influential, important mathematicians. In their context with the late 19th century, early 20th century mathematics involved a lot of foundational trouble. People didn't quite know where mathematics stood. This wonderful fellow named Georg Cantor had come up with all sorts of new ideas about infinity, what it is, what it means. New infinities, countable, uncountable. And, and people really didn't know where the bases of mathematics stood, and they were trying to figure it all out. And again, this is just a teaser, but I want to give you the sort of thesis from the book. And this is, this is a quote. In the specific forms of mysticism represented by the Russian name worshippers, the links between mathematics and religion were carried to a new level. In the early 20th century, mathematicians were perplexed by the possibilities of new kinds of infinities. Georg Cantor suggested that these new infinities and made them seem real by assigning them different names. Where am I? I'm not in the right place. I'm pressing the back button. Why am I doing that? There we are. For some people, the very act of naming these infinities seemed to, to, to create them. And here the Russian name worshippers had their opening. They believed they made God real by worshipping his name. And the mathematicians among them thought that they made their infinities real by simply, similarly centering on their names. And that's the idea. And again, that's just a teaser. But the point I want to make is the interfertilization of ideas. You have a mystical tradition that's talking about naming something spiritual, the name of God. It's intangible. It's hard to get at. It's abstract. We, we don't know how to put our hands on it. We put a name on it. And even though that was perhaps a heretical movement, you only need to look at contemporary North American evangelical hymnody to see that the name of God remains a very important thing. Blessed be the name. Hallowed be thy name. The name is a thing. It's important, it has, it has a place in our spiritual understanding. And mathematics has a thing about naming things that are hard to get at, intangibles. And again, I'm modest here, I don't wanna say that mathematics is naming God, that's, that, that, that's not where we're going, but just that the practice of doing mathematics, of finding a way to talk about intangibles, is I think what's being indicated 
in this, in this book. And it's a lovely book, Naming Infinity. I do suggest you read it if that is interesting to you. And again, that's just a teaser. The thing I mostly want to talk about um, is Simone Weil. And again, here I was going to tell you who Simone Weil was. Uh, don't have to. Very done for me. You've heard about Bourbaki. You've heard about André Vai and the Vai conjectures. So I can sort of move straight on. Uh, I was drawn to this. I, I read Simone Weil many years ago, but I was drawn to this by a recent book by Karen Olson called The Weil Conjectures, where she tries to understand the mathematical influences in Simone Weil's work. And it, this is not a scholarly book, it's sort of a popular history book, but it talks about the relationship between Simone and her brother André and her, in, her way of understanding his mathematics and going to these Bourbaki meetings and trying to understand what's going on. And I'm gonna let um, Olson sort of describe what she understands as what, what Simone is trying to accomplish. Simone Weil wants to reconcile the abstract and concrete. To make philosophers and mathematicians of us all, how that would work is never clear. Math, as Simone sees it, ought to function as a kind of passageway between the mind and the world. I am always double. On one hand, a passive being who is subject to the world, and on the other, an active being who has a grip on it. Geometry and physics help me to conceive how these two beings can be united, but they do not unite them. And later in the book, Simone conceives of a civilization in which mathematical reasoning, mystical belief, and existential loneliness form an energetic triangle. The Greeks, she writes, experienced intensely the feeling that the soul is in exile, exiled in time and space. Mathematics could bring some ease to the exiled soul, she said. Doing math could free you from the effects of time, and your soul could come to feel almost at home in its place of exile. There are many ways I think you could try and connect mathematics in Simone's upbringing and her interactions with her brother and her spiritual and mystical thought. Um, I wanna focus on one. I want to focus on paradoxical thinking. Now, mathematics, particularly the mathematics of infinity, is full of paradoxes. I've got a list here, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but if you want to know what any of these paradoxes mean, do come talk to me. One of my favorite subjects is mathematical paradox. But some of these go back to the Greeks, some of these are more recent. We've got the Achilles paradoxes, you may know about some of these. I can't go here until I go halfway, I can't go there until I go halfway, I can never go anywhere, how do we deal with that? Uh, we've got the idea of infinity as a completed set. The numbers go on forever, but yet mathematicians treat that as a thing. Uh, you, maybe you're not allowed. You can't count all the numbers. How can you treat the natural numbers as a completed whole? That tr troubled mathematicians for centuries is a paradox. Um, the paradox of enumeration. I'm not going to go through all these again. Do come chat with me if you want to know what all of these lovely and wonderful paradoxes are. Getting into the 20th century and set theory. We've got a bunch of other paradoxes. And the point, just with this long list, is to show you this is just, isn't just one problem, this is a perennial problem in mathematics. You want to understand the mathematics of infinity, you have to deal with paradox. And the process of learning how to do infinity in mathematics is the process of dealing with paradox. I really like how David Foster Wallace puts it in his history of infinity called Everything and More. You've almost certainly discerned the story of infinity's overall dynamic, whereby certain paradoxes give rise to conceptual advances that can handle those original paradoxes, but in turn give rise to new paradoxes, which then generate future conceptual advances and so on. It's a kind of dialectic. It's not the same as the philosophical dialectic, but it's that kind of moment, that kind of movement. You have things in opposition that seem to contradict each other and you find a way through, you find something transcendent. Um, I also really like how that is described by the French philosopher Alain Berdieu when he's talking about, again, the same Georg Cantor. What happened was that Cantor had the brilliant idea of treating positively the remarks of Galileo and Pascal and those of the Portuguese Jesuit school before them, in which these authors had concluded 
the impossibility of infinite number. As often happens, the invention consists of turning a paradox into a concept. Since there is a correspondence term by term between the whole numbers and the square numbers, between n and n squared, why not intrepidly posit that in fact there are just as many numbers as numbers? So math grapples with paradox. That's part of the activity, the practice of doing mathematics is to get paradoxes in your head and have them sit there for a while and figure out what to do with them. Simon Weil's spiritual thought is also full of paradoxes. And let me give you a couple of examples of that. These are quotes from the wonderful book, Gravity and Grace, to indicate the way in which paradoxical thinking is part of the spirituality of Simon Weil. Always, beyond the particular object, whatever it may be, we have to fix our will on the void, to will the void. For the good which we can neither picture nor define is a void for us, but this void is fuller than all fullnesses. Later in the book, to see a landscape as it is when I am not there, the contradiction the mind comes up against. These are the only realities. They are the criterion of the real. There is no contradiction in what is imaginary. Contradiction is the test of necessity. And later, all true good carries within it the conditions which are contradictory and as a consequence is impossible. But he who keeps his attention really fixed on this impossibility and acts will do what is good. Now, you could try and make a thesis of training in mathematics caused all of this paradox in Simone's spiritual thinking. I think that would be going too far. I think that's overselling the mathematics. But I think the practice of mathematics shows up in this paradoxical thinking. And let me go back to Olson's book, where I think she describes what's going on between Andre, the mathematician, and Simone, the mystic and religious writer. The Vey siblings both undertook to translate into language something beyond words, beyond symbols, in Simone's case, maybe beyond thought itself. I can only follow either of them so far, reading their words and making guesses at, as to what lay beyond articulation. Each had the run of an elaborate mental or mental spiritual universe, each, each subjected perceptions to a ruthless accounting. They thought their way into esoteric domains, found purpose in concentrated inquiry, and likewise in the glimpse, the pursuit, the almost there, the exhilaration, the frustration of being partially shown at the same time denied the dangling fruits of their searches. And Simone herself in her writing recognizes this dynamic, this way in which working through contradiction leads to something for the soul. It is contradiction which evokes thought. Whenever the intelligence is brought up against a contradiction, it is obliged to conceive a relation which transforms the contradiction into a correlation. And as a result, the soul is drawn upwards. And the idea here is that mathematics is practice for paradox. And I mean practice in both senses of the word, if you allow me a tiny amount of wordplay. The mathematics is a practice, like a law practice, but it is also like practicing the piano, that you practice dealing with paradox in your mind, and this can bring spiritual fruit. Our theology has paradox in it, in creedal theology, the, the incarnation, the trinity, but even in, in the broader sense, you've got to somehow deal with the omnipotent God and the existence of human free will. You've somehow got to deal with the terror of both considering that the universe might end or considering that it goes on forever, and both are, are sort of somehow fundamentally unacceptable to the spirit and the mind. And I don't want to say that mathematics explains the paradox. To say that, oh, there's some infinite sets that have a three-to-one relationship, therefore the Trinity, that's both terrible mathematics and terrible theology. I don't even want to say that it's a good analogy. I'm not even sure that's true. What I want to say is that doing mathematics 
is a kind of training. It's a kind of practice that makes you think about the intangibles, about the paradoxes, about naming to try and access things that are invisible and not concrete and in front of us. And, and this gives a kind of contemplative spirit to mathematics. And that's where I want to end, because Simone herself understood this, I think, and said, the mysteries of the faith are degraded if they are made into an object of affirmation and negation, when in reality, they should be an object of contemplation. And I think in some tiny way, doing mathematics, sitting down, scribbling on chalkboards, contemplating infinity and numbers and the number line and all of the strangeness of that, bears a little bit of fruit. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Are there questions for Rem? My son Nate and I will run the mic as it's helpful to do so. Yes, Nate. Thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. I was really blessed by it. And this morning by Francis as well. So let me just combine the talks together and ask you a question. Uh, bringing in uh, Eugene Wigner, The Unreasonable Effectiveness yeah. of Mathematics, and Simone Weil, whom I absolutely love with the need to represent oneself differently. And uh, I'm wondering, with the last quote that you ended in terms of contemplation, if mathematics for a Christian can be a liturgical exercise. And if that exercise is made possible when we conceive of mathematics in nominalist terms, as convention and construction, rather than in representational realist terms, because I think that, that does violence uh, to our understanding of the world and sometimes brings about a lot of issues in terms of idolatry uh, because now you're looking for something that transcends, mathematical truths that transcends human culture and human history. But in a nominalist perspective, you can talk about truth, justification, beauty, um, exhilaration, excitement, fascination, all of these things without those similar commitments. Yeah, two things there. I, I like the idea of thinking about mathematics liturgically. My phrase that I started with of mathematics as a spiritual practice, I think is moving in the same direction. But there's something about the activity of mathematics, which is, which is mental and internal, that is reminiscent of spiritual contemplation. And again, I think the modesty is important. I don't think you, you want to be really careful not to say that mathematics solves religious problems, but that it... it it trains in contemplation, which has a similar character. In, in terms of the truth values, what's going on, um, I, I agree with you that you, you get into a lot of trouble with a staunchly realist position of mathematical um, entities. The sort of Platonism doesn't necessarily work, although if you read Simone Weil, her thinking about mathematics is actually pretty Platonistic. I, I tend to dislike the nominalist realist uh, duality, I think there are ways you can sort of find a place in the middle there, um, but I don't want to get too deeply into the problem of universals here because we don't really have time for that. But I think that's a, that's a fascinating place to talk about this. And to what extent the things that you are naming are real? Do you, do you create them by assigning them names or are they just sort of labeled? And I think, I think there's some nice subtle philosophy. I forget who I was reading on this that lets you find a way between those sort of two poles, both of which I find sort of unsatisfying at a deep level. Thank you, do we have other questions? Here, yes. Um, I, I think I get to the same place that you get to, Rem, but maybe through a different mechanism and just comparing East and West in terms of uh, comfort with paradox. And I wonder if maybe you could comment on, on, is there, do we have a problem in the West that you're solving with mathematics that Easterners typically do not have? I think we do a little bit because of a kind of rational, log logical enlightenment trajectory. Like it's, it's a lot easier to approach this if you think that the, the Tao can be spoken as not the real Tao. Um, and I, I think it's, 
reasonable and mature for committed Christians to take inspiration from that and to understand what's going on with that movement. Um, I think the Tao Te Ching is, is really, really good reading for both mathematicians and Christians for exactly that reason. Um, but I think, yeah, we're, we're stuck a little bit in our progress individualist Western nonsense that makes this a bit harder. Excellent. Thanks. We're at 155. So if you want to jump to a different talk in another room, go ahead and do so. But we still could entertain a couple questions during the interchange as Bill Jordan makes his way up to the front. We've got one back in the back there, Nate. I, I thought this would be good and it was great. I just want to comment that I fought with my middle school and high school teachers about what is this going to be useful for? And, and more importantly, it just seemed like a way for an adult to force a bunch of kids to do a procedure. And I don't know if there's anything that can be like, nobody was talking about anything like this. And I would have understood it. Um, and so it's not really a question. It's just that there's so many people, they don't have the slightest idea that mathematics is this whole beautiful world. Uh, with um, artistic and philosophical overtones all over the place, and, and it's completely lost. So thank you, and whatever you want to say about that. Let me say two things about that. That's wonderful. First, literally everything that Francis said this morning. Yeah. <laughs> really. Um, second, I think this is a good place to praise the existence of the Christian university, because I wouldn't have gotten to this articulation unless I, I teach at the King's University in Edmonton, which is a small liberal arts Christian university, unless I was given both the time and the direction to say, you need to sit down and figure out what your faith actually says about mathematics. And I've been sort of doing that and reading, and it's taken me a long time to get to a place where I can articulate this. So my thanks goes to all of the founders and upholders of Christian liberal arts university education because I think that's where this is this is created and fostered. Awesome.